Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly broadcast all about the Beatles, anything that has to do with them, whether it's their history, their music, their group years, their solo career, anything that's going on in the news. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. You might know me from my syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing or another podcast show that I do on the solo Beatles called Talk More Talk. And I'm joined by my regulars. First of all, a guy who's been in uh, in New York radio now since 1983 on New York's WFUV. He's done a ton of great work there for the station and lots of work on the Beatles in particular. And that's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Howdy. How you doing? Very good, Darren. And also we have someone who for many years worked at the New York Times in their classical department, writing many articles for them through the years. Also the author of the Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and also got that something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand, changed everything, and that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. How are you doing? Hello, Ken, and hello, everyone. On the show this time, we have a special guest that's going to join us, and that's Chip Manninger. Chip is one of two authors who put together what I call the Bible for the solo Beatles careers, called Eight Arms to Hold You, and he wrote that book with Mark Easter, who unfortunately was not able to join us for this broadcast. And normally in all of our shows, we have lots of news that we present to you at the top of the show. Because we're limited for time, uh, we're going to get through a ton of news on our next show, and we're going to try and have one next week in time for Ringo's 80th birthday. We'll do something special for Ringo. So we're saving up the news. Don't be alarmed. <laughs> we will cover everything in our next show with everything going on in the Beatle world. But for now, let's welcome Chip Manninger to Things We Said Today. Hi, Chip. Hey, guys. Hey, Chip. Hi, Chip. Hey, I'm Darren. The reason that we have Chip on this time, and he was actually a guest on our show a while back for his other book called Leninology, but Eight Arms to Hold You uh, a couple of years ago was revised. And now it's called Eight Arms to Hold You Remastered. It's available as an ebook, And it's basically everything, all the recordings, all the creative work that the four solo Beatles did throughout their solo careers up through the year 2000. And this is as comprehensive a look as you can possibly get. It covers all their commercial releases. It covers studio recordings, live recordings, bootleg recordings, even recordings that haven't been bootlegged covers Paul's classical works. It covers the Lost Lennon Tapes radio series, the Ubu Jubu radio series. Pretty much everything that the four Beatles have done, all their live recordings, uh, even you know, uh, all their dates, where they played, what the set lists were on every single concert. It really is a mammoth book, over 700 pages long, and there's never a week that goes by when I don't look at this book, when I need to do research for my shows, it's that essential. And um, I just recently interviewed you, Chip, and Mark for my show, Every Little Thing. But for just for uh, the casual fan who may not be familiar with this book, can you give a quick explanation as to why you put all this work together? And, um, you know, just basically the work that was put into this, which was tremendous. Well, Ken, you've given a pretty good overview. It's, as you mentioned, a guide to the work of the Beatles as solo artists uh, up through the year 2000. And uh, it's primarily a guide for all of the bootleg items and all the commercial releases. Plus, there are some unbootlegged items listed, um, the live shows, a lot of recording session information. And it was basically put together because it was a, a book I wanted but it hadn't been written yet. I uh, co-authored the solo guide to the Beatles outtakes uh, with Doug Sulpey and uh, started to update that and had a difference in opinions with Doug on, on what should be included. So I, I started off on my own and about a year into that, Mark Easter joined me so he could uh, put some text to the auto parts catalog. Mm. And uh, we worked on it for about two years and then self-published it in October 2000. So it's hard to believe that it's almost 20 years old. Right. Now, there's so much information packed into this book. 
and you can go page by page and learn things that you never learned before. Was there anything, because this was such a big project, was there anything at all that was really difficult to research? Or did all the uh, information come to you? I, no, I, I think there are definitely some holes in it where we just there, the information wasn't available to us. Uh, I think a good example of that would be pretty much anything George did in his home studio from, from 1974 on, uh, outside of the notes that were on, on the record sleeves. And I, if I recall correctly, I did talk to a couple of the session musicians and was able to get some information there. But, but you know, that's one place where we didn't have nearly as much information as we did for the others. Mm, okay. Uh, before I pass you along to my co-host, I just want to ask a couple of questions specifically about John's uh, music. I noticed in one page, I'm only going to, you know, pick a few pages here because there's so much in this book. But on page 63, you cover 1971 home recordings and you've got songs like High Heeled Sneakers from John, My Baby Left Me, The Walk, which you say is unbootlegged, but aired on the Lost Lennon Tapes radio series. How <clears throat> much to date do you know of that still hasn't even been bootlegged from the series? Well, it depends on what you consider to not be bootlegged. I mean, the, the, the radio series, as good as it was, did a lot of slicing and dicing and, and you know, adjusting things to fit time and, and content. Mm. So if you go and take a look at the source tape that the, the Lost London tapes drew their material from, you know, there, there's quite a bit there. I think there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 350, 400 tapes that they were provided with to produce the show. Mm. So, and if, if you guess that they're, you know, 45 minutes, 60 minutes on each one of those tapes, it, it adds up pretty quickly. But uh, I, I don't know that I could put a number on how much is, is still out there. I mean, there's still new things turning up every day, it seems. Yeah. You know, um, while I'm sure this was a labor of love for you, to go through every single take of the same song, and I'm sure in the case of a lot of John's stuff, a lot of what he did on acoustic guitar or piano, a lot of the takes were similar. You know, you had to differentiate one from another. And then what they did in the radio series sometimes was edit a couple of takes together. Exactly. So how did you find that kind of work? Was it very tough to do? It, it was quite an undertaking. And, and you have to remember that this was in the, the pre-computer era. Hmm. So everything was being done by trying to sync up cassette tapes or bootleg LPs in a, in a cassette recorder and trying to match the speeds and, and, and find out where the edits were. So it would have take a lot, taken a lot less time to have done it nowadays than it did back then sure. for that exact reason. All right. One last question. Would you happen to know, is everything that's been released after 2000 of previously unreleased recordings commercially by that i mean john's remixed albums from the 2000s the signature box set which had a whole disc of home recordings uh the imagine box set is that all stuff that was heard during the lost Lennon tape series or is any of that new there's it's both i mean some of that material we'd heard on the radio series but we hadn't heard it in the quality that it might have shown up as one of the bonus tracks. Uh, for example, though, one of the uh, one of the bonus tracks, I think it's on the Sometime in New York City disc, was actually drawn from one of the Vigatone CDs because you can hear the same edits that were on the Vigatone disc. So I think they uh, there was some new, and there's definitely some that we'd already heard before. Mm. Okay, Alan, I pass it over to you. Okay. So uh, I, I remember when you were working on this, we um, talked a lot on the phone during that period. And uh, but but I don't remember how long it was. Do you, do you remember how long it took to do the original book? And then also how how much went into any revising you did for the new PDF version? Well, the original book consists of all the information that I, that I collected ever since I was a collector. Mm -hmm. And I'd done a lot of detailed research on the Lost Lennon tape series. I was I was going to try and put something together on that, but it tended to lend itself more to to the overall guys with be it with the nine ten or with eight arms. But 
So you could say there was maybe 20 years of research in there and a solid two years of writing with Mark and a year of writing by myself before that. Mm -hmm. um, as for the PDF version, uh, we took a, if we knew then what we know now added to with the, with the material, we wanted to add some, some value to the ebook and not just have it be a ported copy of the, of the original. And I'd say there was probably six months worth of work put into that one to mm -hmm. go in and fix the, uh, you know, fix the misspellings and s some of the blatant errors and add new information that had come to light in the 20 years since it was published. Mm -hmm. I probably know the answer to this, which is that you're currently working on the Lemon series, but uh, was that basically the reason why you didn't go from 2000 to uh, 2018 when, when the PDF came out? No, uh, the PDF was originally going to be just a flat copy of, of the book, but as I mentioned, we wanted to add something else, and it, it wasn't so much because of a, a conflict with the material that was going to be coming in the Lennon book, but it was going through a further 18 years of Paul audience recordings and yeah. all-star band audience recordings. And that's, right. that's work for a much younger man. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't thinking of it in terms of conflict so much as the fact that there's only 24 hours in a day. And, you know, you also do a job, I believe. So, um, yes. you know, it's, uh, yes. oh. But, you know, with, I guess with Lennon and Harrison, there'd be relatively little extra work to do compared with, as you say, all those audience tapes of Paul and Ringo. So, yeah. But that was the primary reason was because of the work that was going to be involved in, in bringing all of those up to date, not to mention all the TV appearances. And I mean, because of the computer era, you know, everybody's kind of collectively gathering information and it's getting published here and there and uh, there's a lot more we probably missed a lot up to 2000 just because we didn't have the means of, of searching for it on the internet or you know that we it was all snail mail tape trading back then mm. and uh you know i think it's uh, you know there there's in addition to that live material there's just ton, a ton of tv and interview material out there mm -hmm. So I wasn't up for the task. Did you think you um, might be after you finish the Lennon series? Because oh, someone's going to, someone's going to need to put out something where everybody can look up, you know, the last 20 years worth of, of bootlegs. I'm not sure that, that I'm going <laughs> to be up for that. Uh, you know, if, if somebody else wanted to take it on, I, I could keep an eye on it or and, and lend help where I, where I could, but, you know, your McCartney project is, is going to be exhaustive. And yeah, I'm, I'm just not up for the task with the, with the full-time job. Mm -hmm. But the McCartney project won't actually do what eight arms did for the period it goes up to. We're not going to like do every bootleg, every live recording, mm -hmm. all that stuff. So, uh, which was what we originally wanted to do, <laughs> but, um, now it's now it's more of a more of a straight bio in a way, but with a lot of focus on on the music and the sessions. But so there's still a need for um, for all the updated bootleg stuff. Um, well, maybe uh, it's what was wiki hmm? or maybe it's time for a wiki or something like that because as as you know, the publishing has taken a dive, and and a, a lot of people you know, would rather just download something for free off the net than buy a copy of it. And it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, not, it, it is a labor of love, but it is still nice to see some return and, and to see it not given away on the net. So you think a, a wiki in terms of the sort of global participation in adding info and, and all that stuff? I think so. What, what yeah. I'm primarily doing right now is, uh, going through and doing high res transfers of, of all the material that I have mm -hmm. and making sure that that's all captured and, and ready to hand over to somebody and, and not just get tossed out with everything else. Yeah. Um, I've seen your office. So, uh, <laughs> um, 
yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty much the same thing so yeah yeah when you revised what was some of the most surprising stuff that you came up with i think a lot of the double fantasy stuff was neat because i was able to work with one of the engineers in establishing a true timeline of how the sessions really went down and nowadays i would be able to key all of that lost london material to those dates so there there were some of those dates were included at least to try and tie it to the material that was already in the book but there's still a lot more <laughs> there's still a lot more some new ringo information had come to light uh, mark and i had been asked to start putting together a a, a pair of cds or deluxe editions of uh, Ringo the Fourth and Roto Gravier, and that never came to pass. Hmm. But uh, you know, there there was a lot of paperwork that was generated by that. So that's great. Okay, I should pass you over to Darren. Okay. All right, my turn. How are you, Chip? Good, Darren. Um, How have you been? I'm doing good, and I'm listening to the conversation so far and it's blowing my mind the scope of of the uh, the work that went into eight arms to hold you and leninology i'm curious about taking on such a daunting project if we could go back to like day one when you had an idea of uh, of, of putting a book uh like eight arms to hold you together was your scope as large as what the finished product came out to be or did you start with a smaller idea and as eight arms to hold you was coming together did you realize maybe we let's go and include set lists uh we didn't plan on live performances at the beginning of this but now you maybe we should include that in here as well did it how much did it grow over the process of the writing and the research and uh if you if it did grow a lot if you knew uh, uh, at from day one what it might entail, would you have still pursued the book? That's a good question. With Eight Arms, I think the scope was, was pretty well defined. Uh, you know, we wanted to make sure and, and include not just the bootleg information, but, you know, we knew a lot of things that, you know, hadn't been bootlegged because back then it was a lot tougher to do than it is nowadays. You just, you just burn a CD off. But back then you had to collect the tapes and edit them and master them for LP and find some place to get them, you know. So we kind of knew the scope was to, to be as exhaustive as we could with the information we had at hand. And I think to have delivered that in, in just two years with Mark was, was pretty amazing. I look back at it now and wonder who wrote this thing and, and where did they get all that information? I, I, I just don't remember doing it. Must have been like a Ouija board or something. But uh, Leninology, I was uh, 13 years late in delivering a two-year project. So that ended up taking 15. And I think I've got to say, if I'd have known that, I probably wouldn't have taken it on. I mean, granted, I've got enough information and, and it's written for another two volumes one volume at least so that 15 years wasn't all spent on on the one book it was it was laying the groundwork for the others as well but uh boy that's a big chunk of your life yeah mm -hmm. and at any point did you think that all right eight arms to hold you has been written leninology is now on the drawing board I have to do this or did was there ever a point thinking you have now have to do leninology's or did you want to, at one point, attack Leninologies with the other three Beatles, Leninology-type books? Well, what happened with Leninology um, was I was starting to prepare an update for Eight Arms and collect more information and, and to, to chase down interviews with people that I wanted to talk to but hadn't had the opportunity to. And I never got past John. Mm -hmm. It's just so much there that... I ended up concentrating all my efforts there. So the thought of doing a, a Paul and a George and a Ringo, if there ever was one, it was very fleeting. Um, right. Because there, you, there are people out there that are, that are you know, well-versed in this material and are, are, are qualified to, to prepare it. And uh, I'm good with leaving it up to them. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can help, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to. 
when doing a, a book like this and trying to make a uh, an accurate reference of bootleg recordings, uh, it's it's an un I don't know if this is a proper way of putting it. It's an un an unregulated industry. It's not like you know a record company, record companies. You can look up official records, release dates, press releases, uh, interview employees. Uh, with bootlegs, I would imagine there are things that are pop could potentially be popping out of anybody's basement at any time over a period of 10, 20, 30 years. How does one feel like, I think we've nailed them and tracked them all down. How, does, how do you go about seeing, finding that, listen, I think we've found all of, I don't know, all of the uh, George bootlegs that were made in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. When do you know that you've reached a point where I think we've got them all? Well, at that point in time, uh, you know, 1998 to 2000, that was still in the, the dawn of the CDR. So the, the homegrown CDR, like we know it now, didn't really exist then. So it was a lot easier to keep a, keep a handle on what bootlegs were out there because they were static physical items. They weren't recompiled and remastered the next day by somebody else that decided to EQ it a little differently and give it a different title and another, another bootleg label name. I mean, that, that would be, I think it would be, I'm not sure how I'd handle that nowadays with, with, uh, with how dynamic the collecting industry is nowadays. I think you'd have to lay out there what was actually recorded and, and, and just make a, a side note that, yeah, this, is, this exists on tape somewhere. Mm-hmm. And not try and nail down that, no, it's on the, the 1995 edition of the Lost Lennon Tapes, volume 18. Right. Um, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. So because it was so dynamic, I I think we'd have you'd have to take a different tack about it and and lay out the material and and then you know either online or in, in a wiki or something like that you could say where it could actually be found. Right. Hmm. All right. Up to you now, Ken. Okay. Is it safe to assume, Chip, that up through two thousand? before uh, CDRs and all, that you really were familiar with every bootleg out there? I think so. It, not necessarily all the, un- all the unbootlegged material, but I think we did have a very good handle on all the bootlegs that were out there, just through, yeah. through trading and through, through hot wax. And, uh, you know, there was always the 910 and Belmos and... and so, yes, I think we did have a very good handle on what was out there. And there is a, a, a list in the back of the original eight arms of, of all the boots that you would need to amass to have everything that we'd written, around, written about in the book. Yeah. Well, one of the many reasons why I like eight arms is that, you know, and I don't own every single bootleg there is out there. But I know for a fact that there's so many times when certain recordings are repeated on different bootleg albums. And in your book, you'll even compare. If you've got the same, diff- same recording on two different bootlegs, if the quality is better on one or if one is a few seconds longer than another one. So that, that kind of detail, I mean, you put so much time into this. Some specific questions more about John. I wonder if you can answer. The um, Live in New York City release, and I always knew that for the most part they were the afternoon show. Cold Turkey and Hound Dog were from the evening show, correct? Oh, boy. That was, uh, uh, I will have to pull that up here and take a look. I think I, we put a, a graph in there that showed what was from what. And yes, here it is. Page 83. <laughs> that was uh, just going to say. I was just going to say, you can look it up in eight arms to hold you, Chip. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it tells you what what performances were on the album, what performances were on the video, what performances were on the ABC broadcast, and what performances were on the King Biscuit broadcast, because they weren't necessarily all the same. For example, Come Together on the album came from the afternoon while it came from the evening on, on the ABC show. Yeah. Well, the so ABC they, show I thought yes. was all evening. 
Wasn't the ABC uh, show all evening? You're correct. The ABC yeah. show is all evening. Do you know how were the decisions made as to which performances were used? You know, for the release in particular for Live in New York City? I, I could only speculate. I mean, it, it might have been because of, of sound quality. It might have been because of the, the team's performance to be better. But I don't know any tried or true reason why they picked what they did. Mm. All right. I know they recorded both shows in their entirety, every artist, and they had two machines running the whole time. So every, every second of that uh, concert is on tape, whereas uh, as far as the film goes, uh, Steve Gebhardt, uh, who produced the film, the original film, told me that if Jesus Christ had come to the show, that they wouldn't have had enough film to catch it. <laughs> <laughs> they used up everything. Yep. Yeah. One of the things that I found enlightening, one of the many things in the book, was that during the Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey sessions, you said that there was a tape that was constantly running. And there's 230 tapes, each 30 minutes long, recording the sessions. And John wasn't even aware of it. That's right. Now, it, they only ran for a certain amount of time. They didn't span the entire sessions. Um, when they started, they captured the tracking of all of John's songs. They, they didn't capture the tracking of Yoko's songs until later. When, uh, you know, the, the, the engineers were instructed to, you know, just run it for John's, John's material. Because that album was recorded 100% tit for tat. They did his song, they did her song, they did his song, they did her song, both in the tracking and both in the mixing. And uh, they get back to the to the uh, the running tapes. They basically went up through the mixing sessions at the record plant. And John kind of discovered what was going on at that point. And they, they decided that, well, now that he's he's aware of it, he's he'll be playing to the microphone and it won't be as spontaneous is all of the material that we've already captured. Mm. Okay. I would think John would be all for it, knowing how he loves to record everything. So. Well, apparently he was thrilled that it was there, but you know, they get you get into the last legs of the project, and I think they still had another 10 songs to mix at that point, and uh, three weeks to do it in. You know, they, they were more concerned with, with getting the, the work done as opposed to the, the auxiliary recordings. Hmm. is my is my guess okay so i take it that you did all the listening yourself and mark just did the the text i did all the listening and did a lot of blocking of the text and you know this is what i want to say and you know the, the well-worn adage here is that he took it from the auto parts catalog into something that you could pick up and read and that you could turn to any page in it and, and read from there, and it'd be just as enjoyable as if you were trying to go through the whole thing whole thing at once. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he did a great job with that. So you've actually listened to every single concert that Paul has done, the early years of Wings through the end of Wings, the solo tours. You've listened to the entire 1974 George tour, You've listened to all of Ringo's All-Star Band tours from 1989 <laughs> through 2000. You've taken the time to listen to every single concert. Everyone that was available, yes. When did they I let have... you out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I still remember, you know, I'd listen to them in the car on the way to work and on the way home and uh, keep notes. And I still remember pulling off the road one time when I got a phone call from the guy at Sunset Sound. He said he found a stack of invoices from from mixing Ringo's first live album. And, and yeah, there was I listened to all of them. Huh. Hmm. Now, so what have been the most interesting facts that you discovered in listening to all these solo concerts? Is there anything that really surprised you from listening through to all these tours? After... The early Wings tours, I I, it was really cool to see how well produced and, and rehearsed they really were for Paul's shows. I mean, the 76 show, it was almost the same thing every night. Uh, mm. By the time you got to 2002, it was the same thing every night. 
you know, the, the banner was all the same. And I, I'll have to say that's really what kind of made me take pause was, was the 2002 tour. George's tour was interesting in that the set list was, was really dynamic because of the, they were playing two shows a day and because they had Ravi's uh, Indian music interspersed in the set. So, and it probably could have done with a little more rehearsal, but you've, you've heard what it did to George's voice. So, yeah, yeah, I, I listened to all of them and I am out, Alan. (laughs) (laughs) I would, I I would imagine there were a couple of times along the way that you had to reintroduce yourself to your family. Yes. (laughs) Yep. And, uh, they, they both called me yesterday, so I must've done all right. Okay. (laughs) And and riding in the car with dad was probably like, oh, no, dad, we got to listen to another Ringo concert. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I don't mean to jump in here, but, you just, but while we're talking about George's tour, can you compare the condition of his voice from the first shows to the end? And do you hear an obvious deterioration? I think so, but it's been so long since I, I did those. I couldn't say for certain, but. I'd, I'd have to think there there was because he it was really pretty worn out by the time he got to New York City. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those recordings aren't really in good enough quality to pick up a nuance like that. Madison Square Garden, there is a really good tape out there of, of most of one of the shows. But, uh, yeah, we, we've only got scattered bits of soundboards here and there. And, and like everybody else, I, I, I'd love to see a complete George show, either be it at least on audio, but I think there's the film there to do it as well. But uh, things don't seem to be forthcoming from Friar Park. Mm-hmm. Well, no, actually, recently there there was a report from the Harrison family about doing 50th anniversary releases for All Things Must Pass and then possibly Bangladesh living in the material world and then the 74 tour. They had an article in Rolling Stone about that. Yeah, but you look at the stuff that they've put out already, and they're starting with not the Spinners, who's who was the uh, the Stair Steps greatest hits, hmm. and and you know some of the uh, the Jim Keltner and Danny Cooch, um, Paul Stallworth album uh, attitudes. Yes, yeah. you know why why are you going to start with things like that instead of the really good stuff like the any George material or any of the splinter material it just, it just doesn't make sense right. so it, it could be that they they're timing it for the anniversaries for each could be it could be i mean the 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 anniversaries seem to go by the wayside anymore i mean it's neat from a marketing standpoint but it really doesn't mean anything you know it's neat to say it's 50 years old but if it was 51 years old would it really matter um yeah you know I, imagine I, i'm sorry I'm sorry. I was going to say a few years ago, I had I interviewed Danny Harrison at WFUV when he was promoting his Parallel album. And mm-hmm. towards the end of the interview, I got up a little bit of the nerve to kind of switch the conversation just briefly to his dad. And the impression I got from him, but this was three years ago, was that they were sort of they had sort of closed up the vault and had didn't have any plans on going in there and, you know, uh, putting out more more stuff sounded sounded to me like you know what was out there is you know can't be improved upon there's no need to dig deeper now of course things may have changed in their eyes that you know in harris had the george harrison estate but in, the impression i got from danny in 2017 was there really wasn't going to be anything coming out any additional material and and you really can't blame him because you know he he's got his own career that he that he wanted to foster and and uh, to go back and go through all your dad's stuff probably isn't top of the hit list. Mm-hmm. Um, you know Yoko took an alternate tack, and I think it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know what what's out there still isn't you know not of the caliber. You know it's it's outside of the the home recordings and maybe the running tapes. And uh, some alternate mixes. There, I don't think there's much there in the, in the Lennon estate. I mean, there are no un, unreleased songs at this point, aside from from home demo material. Mm-hmm. 
when you get down to it, even with all the archival box sets that McCartney's put out, Yoko has still put out so much more on John just from the Lost Lennon Tapes radio series. It's been much more exhaustive, maybe not nearly as organized or well presented, but but when it comes down to the quality or the quantity of the material, Paul doesn't even come close, and that that's kind of a head scratcher as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, don't you think? Oh yeah. I mean, there's 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 a lot there. I mean, there's a lot of live wing stuff, and maybe we'll see a live collection someday. But you know, there. Are, a half dozen or maybe almost a half dozen 72 shows that were professionally recorded. Uh, same with the 73, right. uh, 76, every one of them was taped only a couple of the 79s. And then I'm sure once they went to hard disc and in 89, that, that I'm sure every show has been captured then as well. Yeah. Oh. And, and he has everything, you know, he has it, he has it archived, he has it cataloged, not all of his dates are right, but, um, but he has it there for, you know, whatever use he wants to make of it. But, you know, I mean, he has this like a, a special problem these days, you know, because of digital and where, uh, you know, it used to it used to actually cost something to make endless takes of something on tape. But on digital, it's like so long as you can you have enough hard drives, you're fine. And I interviewed him once and he was talking about having some stuff shipped to his uh, studio where he was going to archive it. And it was, you know, something like, you know, 153 boxes. And he said, well, how many albums is that? And they told him, oh, no, these are just, you know, ballroom dancing. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, it would be hard. It would be hard to sort of go through all that stuff looking for for more takes to release. Because there's probably tons that are releasable. But, you know, it depends how many albums worth of ballroom dancing you want to hear. Yeah. Uh, you know, ideally, it would be great if they were to do a band camp type of thing where people could just buy the downloads of whatever they wanted, put it all up and... Uh-huh. You know, or, or like the King Crimson Collectors Club, right? <laughs> Which uh-huh. I'm a member of, and I ne- and I need a, a, a separate house for all the stuff that's that uh, Fripp's been putting out. All right, we'll talk after. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I honestly think that even after all the McCartney box sets come out, it'll probably come out again, <laughs> a more updated one with more material. I don't think it's ever going to end. No, they're already starting over again with McCartney in the record store. They, you know, half speed master of McCartney. I mean, I don't, I don't see how that's going to get much better than the, than the high res that came out with the, the book 10 years ago. Hmm. But I between, mean, between remastering everything and just upgrading the sound quality and then putting out bonus material that hasn't come out before this, this could go on forever. This could go on long after Paul and Ringo are gone, you know, with their solo music and and even with the Beatles. Yeah, yeah I, I still have hopes that someday EMI is just going to put it all up there and, and 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 let people buy it as downloads. But, you know, I'm, I'm not running the store. Hmm. Right. Did you ever have any feedback from Yoko or any of them, even indirectly about about eight arms? I actually did hear that Eight Arms was, there was a copy at Friar Park that they were using to help organize his tapes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that was kind of cool. And okay. I've heard indirectly uh, from the Lennon camp that Studio One, not necessarily Yoko, is is quite taken with, with the Leninology book. Mm-hmm. So, and when does the next volume of that come out? Uh, I think it's going to be a race between you and Aid and Mark and I to see who can take the <laughs> longest to get their job. <laughs> I see. Okay. I mean, with, with the with the, the shutdown, uh, you you think uh, it would be an opportune time to get a lot of writing done, but I, I don't think I've done any except for a small piece on on some 1980 photographs. I haven't done anything. I've I've been working with cataloging the tapes and making sure that those 
don't get lost. Mm -hmm. So what is the next volume going to be? The idea was for it to be all of the, the studio and live and all the professionally released items. And maybe the next volume would be all the home recordings and private tapes or vice versa. Mm -hmm. I don't know, or, or else it could be prepared like eight arms where they're, they're merged together. And the first part is everything he did before he left the UK and everything that he did once he was in the States. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it's all kind of plug and play at this point. It's, it's, it's written up, but uh, the, the final presentation or, or layout isn't in stone yet. Okay. Well, looking forward to those two volumes. Yeah, I, I'm, I am too. <laughs> <laughs> They're clearing Chip, my desk. Chip, a question about uh, as the research was going on for e either of the books, any, you know, either Eight Arms to Hold You or Leninology, what little bits of information that you didn't know going in that you learned that excited you the most that you discovered? What was really cool about the, the work on Leninology was how much Yoko was was really a part of it all and how much she encouraged him to show off his, his other artistic talents oh, you know yeah. he, for him to try it filmmaking or for you know she she got him to try things that probably wouldn't have otherwise so that was pretty neat and, and how much their their work was released in parallel could you comment about, because you tend to think all the avant-garde films that John and Yoko made, the ideas must have come from Yoko. You know, how much of that was John's idea? Well, let's think here. I think the Freedom films were John's idea, although he did his own film and she did her own film. It was a film contest for, uh, I'd have to go back and look it up, but those were both their registrations for the, for this film contest. Um, I think the Imagine film was, it was, you know, every, pretty much everything they did guys from once they got together was a collaboration of some sort, except for during the separation. Right. Hmm. Going back to eight arms, were there inaccuracies from other books that you corrected in your book? Yes, and there are still inaccuracies that made it through. But Leninology was approached differently in that we start. I co-authored that with Scott Riley, by the way, mm -hmm. um, after starting it on my own. So I, I see a pattern. <laughs> Started from scratch on that and went in. You know, we know nothing, and we everything had to come from a contemporary report or document so that because you know our memories aren't any good and everybody else's memories you know you ask the the question on when the beatles met elvis and you, you saw an anthology and you got all the different answers so all the interviews that were conducted were to maybe get us pointed in the right direction or to be used as color but all of the facts from in the Leninology are rock solid. They all came from documentation or news reports of some sort. Eight Arms, we kind of took what we had and uh, we didn't have as much documentation available. So we, we took educated guesses at a lot of things and a lot of them have turned out right. There's still some howlers in there, but we fixed those in the ebook version. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I know Mark likes to bring up, I think it's important to bring up, is that Wings Over America really was truly a live album. It wasn't an album that the band did in the studio and doctored it up as though it was a live album. That's right. Hmm. Uh, you go back and you look at the paperwork on, on the mixing sessions for that, and they'd mix two or three songs a day. So they, they didn't spend a lot of time on the album uh, I think where all the time and all the fixes came in were for the rock show film mm -hmm. where they had to get the, the, the image, which was often from a different concert because I think they filmed two or three shows, LA, New York, Seattle. And, but the audio came from different sources. So in order to get things to sync properly and to 
to sound right, I think there was a lot more work spent on the soundtrack for, for Rock Show. Okay. Would you happen to know, because if you buy the Best of Dark Horse box set, it comes with the videos from the Live in Japan uh, tour, and they're just select songs. Were there concerts that were filmed in their entirety professionally? Not that I'm aware of. I think the only the only professionally shot film you're going to get for those was if somebody captured the feed from the, the in-house big screen. Hmm. That's surprising. You'd think uh, the, they would have they would have recorded one or two concerts. So, and and I don't know if there were plans to, for that tour to continue on elsewhere, and maybe they were going to film it there, or you know, I, I can't say. It, it just doesn't make sense that two artists of that caliber didn't film one of the shows. Yeah, yeah. I had always heard that that was going to be like a warm up to yeah. lead to a U.S. tour. And then I've also heard that George wasn't too happy doing it when he was in Japan, and that's why it was canceled. So but is George ever really happy? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. No, I think we're we're all speculating at this point, and, and unless we see anything out of Friar Park, that that's 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 Darren. I haven't heard that about Danny's response. That's disheartening. But, well, but understandable. You know, you know, I mean, again, that that was that was his point frame. Of, that was from what he said three years ago. You never know what. I mean, his thought process could change. An offer could come across the table. Um, you know, but in 2017, it had been quiet. I, I don't recall if I brought up early takes volume one, but I'm sure I had that in mind when saying, "Where's volume two? And 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 where's other stuff from?" those sources you know that was kind of like on my mind but you know again that was i think towards late 20, 2017 so not even quite three full years mm -hmm. if you follow what was in that article in rolling stone olivia harrison seemed pretty excited about the unreleased stuff that exists like with all things must pass she seemed pretty animated about it you know so i have a feeling things have changed i can't swear to it but maybe because of bringing the Dark Horse label back, that's kind of setting the wheels in motion for everything else to happen. Mm -hmm. So we can only hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know all of the songs from All Things Must Pass had huge take numbers, which is not surprising. And I think all of the, the songs were released or we have on bootleg now, like the Get Back take and the... Uh, you know, the things that came out on the strawberry bootleg. Hmm. Uh, I don't think there are a lot of, you know, there isn't a band take of Woman, Don't You Cry For Me, for example. Even though it dated back to then, there isn't a, a full band version of that. Well, if there are a lot of takes of different songs, just different takes could be interesting. Of course. You know, you take, take even if you just do the complete takes, where all things must pass stripped down or naked, whatever you want to call it, you know, the, without the Spectre stuff, you know, just hear it as a, a, a simpler album. I think I'd be interested in that, you know, mm -hmm. not to re, not to replace all things must pass necessarily, but just as an alternative view, like, you know, like the strawberry boot and uh, songs for Patty, stuff like that. Sure. I don't know how baked in Phil is on those tapes, but you know, Time will tell. Yep. Yeah. I just want to ask two more questions real quick. Um, one has to do, since we're talking about George, there was a recording that leaked out through Olivia Harrison a few years ago of a song called Fear of Flying, which is a song that was first done by Charlie Dore, the artist, who's best known for the song Pilot of the Airwaves. And it was only a minute of the song. And she featured it on Jules Holland's uh, TV program. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard it. And do you know anything about it when it was recorded? Anything at all? Nope. Nope. I mean, that, 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 thing's, that place is a fortress. I'm sure there are hundreds and hundreds of hours of, you know, unrealized recordings there. And it's frustrating, but, you know, they, it's their right to do what they want to with it. Mm -hmm. Well, she wouldn't play it on the show unless you'd hope 
that she'd have uh, plans of releasing it at some point. Yeah, but you'd have to get all the legal clearances and the copyrights and all that organized and probably would have been might have seemed to be more trouble than it was worth. But there's still a couple other things that have crept out. Um, and of course, I'm drawing a blank on them now. Mm. And we talked in, in our previous interview about Let It Be Me, that recording yes. that was on early takes. It's a lot earlier recording than I thought because, you know, the sound of George's voice, it sounds like it's towards the end of his life. But mm -hmm. you, you've heard differently? Uh, um, I'd have to go back and I, I don't recall off the top of my head. Sorry. All right. One last thing. I, I'll get, go ahead, Darren. I was going to say I want to throw one last Ringo related question in. In your research with Ringo's recordings, talking studio albums, the fact that he was on so many different labels, did that make your work more difficult? Being that he, you know, been on so many labels and uh, source material might have been hard, easy to come by working with one group of people as opposed to another? It came in chunks on Ringo. A lot of it came from the Musicians Union. Mm -hmm. So th that, was, that was quite helpful. And, and other things came from, you know, when we were dealing with Atlantic, you know, all the paperwork for that came from them. But we still don't know anything about Bad Boy. Um, really? Yeah. I, I think uh, Nancy Andrews might be able to, you know, maybe she's got some diaries or something that, that might. And that would be because CBS or Portrait doesn't exist anymore or CBS didn't keep same type of records? Uh, I think it was that we weren't able to, to crack CBS. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, my last question for you, uh, this concerns off the ground. My uh, second to favorite. You second to McCart favorite Neal. McCartney? Neal? Really? What's no, your favorite? I, I really don't like off the ground. Oh. But. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. I mean, one of them has to go the, that way. <laughs> On page 346, you say that 25 demos of songs from that period, from off the ground, was given to producer Julian Mendelssohn, some of which were never included on the album. Songs like Magic Lamp, Wish You Were Mine, If You Say So, Wedding Invitation, Simple Song, On a Pedestal. Where did you find all that out? I think that information came from one of the roadies. I okay. think that came from from our uh, yeah. I think that was all from from a a diary. Okay, it'll be interesting to see once the box set comes out for that if any of those songs find their way on it. So and and we weren't making up titles like uh, Martin Lewis. You know, these <laughs> were all things that somebody had said were were actual songs. So hopefully we we didn't mislead anyone. Okay. All right. This has been great. Before we uh, say goodbye to Chip, why don't we all just give our own contact information and say what's going on with us? And we'll start with Darren. All right. Well, um, you can reach me at my WFUV email address, which is Darren DeVivo, spelled out D A R R E N D E V I V O, at WFUV.org, or go to Facebook. And I've actually kind of been playing around with my two Facebook pages and I pretty much decided, you know what, they're both fair game. So uh, rather than directing you to one and not the other, you could look me up at Darren DeVivo. Uh, there is also another one and I've just changed the name of it and I don't remember what the new name is, but it's something to the effect of Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatle podcaster, writer. Uh, which is wishful thinking, the last part, but I've got my own little thoughts in the back of my head that may come out one day. So look for those two Facebook pages, like them both, and eventually I'll try to come up with uh, unique content for the two of them. <laughs> okay. Alan, how about you? Yeah, the easiest way to get to me is through Facebook, either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, they're similar remixed, I think has more Beatles stuff and Alan Cozen has whatever I feel like putting up sometimes to do with mendacity at the highest levels of government. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, you can contact all of us at things we said today, radio show at 
gmail.com. That's one word, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter feed, which is at things we said fab. And we have a couple of group Facebook pages too. There's things we said today, Beatles radio fans and things we said today. And you can, um, when we put the shows up, we post links there to them. You also can find them on Podbean and uh, YouTube and I guess iTunes as well. All right. Very good. Chip, how about you? I've made it very easy. You can get the books, uh, be it Leninology, soft or hardback, or the Eight Arms Still Hold You ebook at leninology.com. As for Facebook, I've, there's a Leninology page, and then I have my own personal page. So you can find me there. Okay. As for me, uh, a couple of things. I have a Facebook page, Ken Michaels. You can friend me there. I have an email address, everylittlething at att.net. And then there's my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. I should say that uh, if you want to hear more of Chip, you not only get Chip in my interview, but you get his co-author, Mark Easter, who unfortunately couldn't uh, be with us for this broadcast. But uh, we do more talk on Eight Arms to Hold You, more information that you can uncover in the book. Really is an amazing book to pick up, and I would definitely recommend to everybody into the solo careers. It's, it's indispensable. There's never been anything this thorough and this comprehensive through the year 2000. So you can find that on my website, the interview I just did with Chip and Mark. It's on my interviews page four page. I also just want to mention quickly that um, I've been making the rounds on various Beatle podcast shows to talk about my history doing Beatle shows since I just uh, surpassed 2000 shows uh, when you combine all the podcast shows and my music show, Every Little Thing. So I am actually on uh, the show Fans on the Run with a young Canadian guy named Ethan Alexanian. And we talk about my whole love of the Beatles, how it all started, my favorite songs from them, my favorite solo music, all that. And uh, I'm also on the show Tomorrow Never Knows with Warren Brown and Bob Wilson. They kind of took a this is your life approach and sprung that on me by surprise. <laughs> and a number of people uh, turned up to say hello and congratulate me. And um, you can find that on YouTube as you can fans on the run. And then there is this very lively Australian guy named Plastic EP who just interviewed me a couple of nights ago at midnight. You get uh, I did I- one with him as well. Yeah. Just the other night. And he, he's a live wire. Yeah, yes, he is. And that was uh, 30 minutes that flew right by for me. And that's also on YouTube. So fans on the run, Tomorrow Never Knows, and Plastic EP. I'll also be on the uh, solo McCartney podcast, All or Nothing, with Sam Wiles very soon discussing the Flowers in the Dirt album. And I also want to mention that starting... This week, one of the new prizes I can give away on my website, in addition to the ebook for Eight Arms to Hold You, which is one of my nine prizes, um, is Lanny Stagg's book, Recipe Records, A Culinary Tribute to the Beatles. So if you want to come up with dishes in which the names of them revolve around song titles from the Beatles or albums or the Beatles' names, it's in this wonderful book. That's one of nine prizes you can win on my website at kenmichaelsradio.com. All right. This has been wonderful. Chip, thanks so much for joining us, and you are welcome back anytime. Hopefully, we can get you and Mark on, that the, show, great. on the show together. Let us know. Keep us up to date on Leninology. And uh, thanks for being here on the show. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Chip. Yeah, thanks, See you guys. Chip. Okay, so... For Darren DeVivo, Alan Cozen, and Chip Mattinger, this is Ken Michael saying thanks to all of you for listening, and we will see you next time.